Praise the Lord. I'd like to read this morning from Proverbs chapter number 4, verses 14 through 19. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and, in their, sleep, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for your word, Lord, that we can have that with us, that we can open it and we can read it and study it and Lord, your word tells us that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So often we want to get as close to, to sin and to the, the lust of the flesh, Lord, and yet still have one foot in, in our, our faith and one foot in the world. And Lord, we know that's not right. Lord, I just pray this morning that as you speak to us through your word, that you convict our hearts, Lord, cause us to have a desire to walk with you to be that shining light that we're supposed to be. We love and praise you, Lord. We thank you for all that you do. We are so blessed. We look forward to what you're going to do this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, one one uh, announcement. Um, starting the first Sunday in September, some of you may already know this if you go to Sunday school, we're going to be meeting September, October, November. We're going to be meeting in here. Our Sunday school is going to be in here every morning. Everybody's going to have it together. During COVID, we did that for, I guess, a year. And uh, anyway, a lot, a lot of people really like that. And so we're going to do that for a quarter, go back to that. And we're going to have some different Sunday school material. Uh, we'll, we'll have that back on the, on the back uh, table back there next Sunday. So everybody get a, a book. But we don't have an overabundance of books, so um, hang on to it and don't lose it, because if you do, you may not get another one. So, um, but that'll be starting up not next week, but the, the first Sunday in September. So looking forward to that. We're going to have a different teacher every week, some of our regular teachers and some of the guys that, uh, that fill in for, for our different teachers in their Sunday school classes. So that'll be a, it'll be a real interesting and, and fun time and a good time in the Lord. So. All right, we always like to welcome our first-time visitors with us, and if this is your first time here to worship with us, um, we're not going to embarrass you, but if you just hold your hand up just for a moment so we can see where you're located. Got a couple down here. Got one down here. Get a little bit higher. Thank you. Praise the Lord. And if you would, please just take uh, that card he's given you and just fill that out. And on your way out this morning, if you put that in one of the plates in the back of the sanctuary, we'd be very grateful. Thank you. Amen. If you would now turn to page 405. Um, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but last night we saw this weird train of, I guess they called it Starlink something satellites, but it was a bunch of stars running across all at the same time. Did y'all see that? And then I had two or three people tell me different things about it, and I don't know anything about it at all, and I sure don't have faith in some of the things people tell me. Amen. My kids were actually freaking out about it. They were scared. I said, no, it's, it's, I said, I'm sure it's something some people put together, but I told them this last night. I said, you know what? I know the one that hung the real stars in place. We can have faith in him. Amen. And uh, this song is Have Faith in God. That's a great reminder. So page 405, sing with us. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches over. God when your prayers are unanswered. 
answered your earnest plea. He will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust his word, and be patient. Have faith in God, he'll answer yet. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Congregational out of the hymn book will be page 338. Page 338, how firm a foundation. If you would stand with us as we sing, page 338, God's word is our foundation. Amen? Let's sing this out. How firm a foundation ye say. seated our youth choir will come at this time and we will be doing song that I believe is very complimentary to the message no dad's preaching in James 5 
And uh, I don't know if you realize this, but on a global level, if you're an American, you're a rich person. Amen? But the Bible is very clear. Riches are fleeting. We're not to trust in them. And ultimately, our worth is not in what we own. Amen? And uh, this is a song that by now many of you that are faithful here know. So we want to encourage you, if you know the tune and you want to sing along with us, feel free to do this because... Especially that refrain, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure. I think that's something we should do. You should rejoice in your Redeemer. And we know what it's like to rejoice in stuff. If you're a grandparent, you rejoice in your grandbaby, right? You show pictures, you brag on them, and that kind of thing. And a lot of times we have, a, I think, as Christians, have a little problem actually rejoicing in the Lord. But if He saved us, then we should be willing to open our mouth and brag on him. Amen? Amen. So sing with us, if you will. My worth is not in what I own.
Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. I hope you came to expect a blessing from the Lord today. And uh, we're certainly glad you're here. A nice, cool building. It's hot outside. How many of y'all can remember those good old days when the church had no air conditioning? Uh, some of you guys my age or older nodding your head. You can remember. I remember we used to have those old... We called them swamp coolers, and uh, they would put fresh water in them on Sunday mornings, and they would blow through the windows, and uh, we liked it when the deacons put too much water in them because it would blow mist right through the building, and us kids would fuss over who got to sit there and get that cool mist all over them. Don't you miss those good old days? Y'all remember when the pews were made out of one-by-fours? And they were saving money when they built them, so they left a gap of about an inch and a half between each of the boards. I like that. I'd like to revert back to that. We would have a lot less sleeping during the service if uh, we could go back to those good old days. Well, I'm glad we've got an air conditioner and a soft place to sit. Let's all stand together. It's good to have you in the Lord's house today. We're going to go to the book of James, chapter 5. Most of you are aware that for a good long while now, I can't remember, probably six months, we've been traveling through the book of James. The good thing about traveling through the book of James is as we go verse to verse, no one can actually, with any credibility, say, the preacher was preaching straight at me this morning. He, he, uh, he prepared a message uh, straight for me. You can't do that when we're preaching verse by verse right through the Bible. But I have found that almost every place that I read in the Bible, God is aiming directly at me. And I believe that that can be said of most of us. And so this morning, we're going to be there in James chapter 5. And uh, Pastor Clay and I talked about this uh, at length yesterday and I wanted to just put a simple title on the message. You may have seen it on the screen a little earlier. It is not your own. And I asked Clay if they would do that song that they just did, My Worth is Not in What I Own. What a powerful, powerful song that they sing that is certainly inspired of Scripture. The Bible says in James chapter 5, beginning with verse number 1, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire." Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. <clears throat> pay, pay attention to this verse. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. A rather strange passage of Scripture as it speaks to the sin of the misuse of and the unjust acquired wealth that so many people have. So with that said, let's just pray together. Father, we're grateful to you. We love you, Lord. And God, I thank you for reminding us that it is not our own. God, it is not, my worth is not dependent upon what we have. Lord, our worth is based on who has us. And so, Lord, we thank you 
God, help me to preach this passage and pray that, God, it would have an effect on our lives. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Now, once again, just to bring us up to, up to speed here, <clears throat> over the last number of months as we've traveled through uh, the book of James, a rather short book, five chapters, but filled with admonitions for us to live the life that Christ has enabled us to live by His grace and to check ourselves, <clears throat> if we may use that term, and to know for sure that the faith that we profess is a faith that is enduring to the end, not a faith that fizzles in the face of difficulty, but a faith that will endure to the end, a faith that will last, if you will, throughout this life. Now, James has given us a number of tests to know whether or not our faith is a real, genuine faith. And I just want to touch some of those, and not, I'm not even going to give you the address to them. You can find them there in the book of James. But he started out by telling us that whether or not our faith is real can be determined by how we respond to the trials that come along in our lives. As I look out across this congregation and even look inward at my own life, we have to realize that every one of us will be going into a trial, we are coming out of a trial, or we are right in the middle of a trial right now. And one of the ways that we can know whether our faith is real is how we respond to the trials that come along in our lives. Do we blame God? Do we, do we blame others? Uh, do we run to the world for counsel? Or do we stay with the Word of God? Another test that he gave us was how we deal with the temptations that come along in our lives. And uh, every one of us face various temptations from day to day. I think that it would be safe to say that the opportunity to be tempted has escalated greatly in the last 10 or 15 years because of our attachment to social media, because of our attachment to these uh, devices that everyone has to have. And at the very touch of a button, you, are, uh, you can satisfy that temptation. And it's uh, not like you have to go to the store and buy a filthy magazine anymore. You can just mash a button and it's right there in your, uh, right in your eyes. And so how we respond to those temptations is a good test of whether or not my faith is a real faith. He also talked about the tongue and how we use our tongue and how that we can edify with our mouth or how that we can destroy others by the very words that we speak. He also gives us a test as to how we respond to the Word of God. And again, I preached all these in some depth, and so I'll not do it again. But how do we respond to the Word of God? And... Um, then he goes on and talks about how we treat other people and talk about being partial. When the Bible says that our God is no respecter of persons, but oftentimes we find ourselves being respecters of persons. As a matter of fact, uh, the Lord gave an illustration there in the book of James, and I've touched on it oftentimes over the last few months, how that uh, a person comes into the, the assembly or comes into the church, if you will, and uh, the ushers notice that this man is well-dressed and he drove a nice car and he's all clean and all proper. And so they look at him and they make a determination. They make a judgment that this man is, is a rich man. This man is worthy of our attention. And so they take the rich man and they give him a seat right on the front where he can be right close to where everything's going on. But in a few minutes, another man comes into the sanctuary and he is not dressed properly, as one may define properly. His clothes are ragged and torn, and his, he doesn't smell as good as the other guy. He hadn't had a bath in a while, and he didn't have a car. He rode his bicycle to church that day. And the ushers look at him, and they think, you know, he could be an embarrassment to somebody. And so we'll get him a chair. Uh, just stand right here for a minute, sir, and we'll run to the fellowship hall, get you a chair. We'll put him in a folding chair somewhere back there behind the sound booth where you won't be noticed. And God condemns that. 
God says, I am no respecter of persons and you must not be. And one of the ways that we can know if our faith is a real faith that will endure to the end is how we treat other people that may not be just like us. He goes on, how we respond to the world. The Bible says this world is the enemy of God. And so how can we, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, how can we be friends with the world when the world is a declared enemy against God? Now, before I move off this, I want to make sure we understand this. Do you understand that James says, and it's other places in Scripture, that the world is the enemy of God? If you understand that, I want to hear it. Amen? Amen. So how can we then, as believers in Christ, be friends with a world that, that is at war with our Heavenly Father. And the Bible teaches us that that is not compatible. Those things are not compatible. So one of the ways we can tell if our faith is a saving, enduring, genuine faith is how we respond to this world. Last week we talked about the will of God. Now, I didn't get finished with that message, um, and as we end up the book of James, I'm going to come back to the message that I preached last week, and we're going to cover that one again, and before I go to the message this morning, and all of this is just introduction, so hang on here, this thought came to my mind, and I made a note of it so I wouldn't forget. If you, how many of y'all are saved? Say amen. amen. Man, that was good. I like that. Since I preached it really, really straight and hard, how many of you realize that God has a specific plan, will, for your individual life? He does. He does. Now, if you could know what His will is, now I've got you going now, so stay with me. If you could know what His will for your life is, would you want to know? Ooh, we lost a bunch then. Okay, we're going to do that again, try to bring them along, okay? You might miss the first loop, but we carry two. Right, Chet? We always carry two loops. Okay, so if you could know the will of God, would you want to know? Amen. And if you knew, would you do? Okay? I hope that you didn't say amen just because you thought that I could see every one of your mouths move. <laughs> but that is a sobering question. Now, you might say, well, you preached that last week. I didn't finish it last week. If God was willing to reveal His will for your life, would you want to know? And if you know, would you be willing to do? Okay? Now... With that said, I'll finish that message in a few weeks. Matthew chapter 5 and verse, I'm sorry, James chapter 5 and verse number 1. Let me preface the actual preaching of that passage by saying this. Having riches in your hand is not a sin provided that they do not get into your heart. Okay? Now, you got to, we've got to get this down. Having riches in your hand is not a sin so long as they do not get into your heart. And I'll give Scripture on that in just a bit. Now, I want you to go all the way back to James chapter 1. And uh, some of you are panicking now that we're going all the way back to chapter 1. And I want you to look there with me at verse number 1. Pastor Clay and I talked about this yesterday. We, we seldom talk about the messages that we're going to preach, but we did yesterday. And uh, in order to keep things in context, uh, Clay reminded me of, of to whom James was writing. Okay, now this is important, so follow me along here. The Bible says in James 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So he was writing to the twelve tribes that had been scattered 
by religious persecution. Okay, now you've got to keep this in mind because in, in order to be in context. Now, even in context, you may think, what does this message have to do with us today? And how is it applicable to us today? And there are certainly applications that we can make. But I want to make sure that we keep it in the context. So he's preaching or he's writing the letter to those who were scattered because of religious persecution. Now, there were some of those that had been scattered that had reunited, if you will, come together. And many of them had possessions. Many of them had maybe found good jobs. Uh, maybe they had acquired uh, some land. Maybe they had acquired some wealth. And they were doing quite well. But there were still others, and you can do some Bible history and find this out, but there were still others of the scattered, those that had been scattered because of religious persecution, that didn't have anything. As a matter of fact, they were very nomadic. They just kind of went from here to there and tent to tent. And uh, as is said of Jesus, a lot of them didn't have a place to lay their head. And they needed help. They needed some support. And, and not just monetarily or materialistically, but they needed some help uh, in a spiritual way and, and such as that. And James is making a note here. He's preaching to those of those that had been scattered, but now they were well to do if you will and he was he was exhorting them actually he was rebuking them because they were ignoring the cries of those that were literally of themselves but they were not willing to help them they were hoarding what they had neglecting those that truly had a need now some of you right now are shaking your head so you can understand that even though in context it was written to them, it is applicable to you and I today. Clay mentioned something while ago behind the pulpit. The kids were gathering. I don't know if you heard what he said. But if you live in America today, you are rich. You are rich. We live in a place where you can own your own car. You can own your own home. You can own your own land. You have the freedom to come and go and buy and sell as you please. You have the freedom to come to the house of God and open your Bible without fear of persecution. But can I tell you, it's not always going to be that way. But it is that way today. And though oftentimes we as churches come under threats and such as that, it's so minute, it's so little compared to the things that, that, that early Christians went through. And so I want to make sure that we have the context. And so there were those that had, and they were so selfish that they were not willing to share with those that were in dire need. Now, in Psalm 62.10, I'm going to hit some of these places. You don't have to follow me because we're going to move quickly, make a note of them if you'd like, or you can listen to this later on however they do that to where you can listen to it on your device, okay? Psalm 62, 10 says, if riches increase, now this is important, if riches increase, set not your heart upon them. So if God graciously increases your wealth or your substance, if you will, your material things, if God increases that, that's fine. But don't set your heart on those things. Now, Proverbs 22, 1. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. I think that's self-explanatory to realize that a good name, in other words, to have a good reputation for it to be well spoken of you amongst the brethren and even in a lost community for it to be well spoken of you is more important than all the silver and all the gold and all the wealth that one could amass. Now in the text, it seems that James had been familiar with maybe the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus uh, preached. And I'll not ask you to turn there, but in your quiet time, you can go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19 and 20. When the Bible, once again, makes reference to lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this earth where rust and, and, and the moths uh, come through and eat and destroy. Don't do that. 
And we see James basically saying the same thing that Jesus said there in the Sermon on the Mount. So we also realize James, being inspired of the Holy Spirit, gives us another test as to whether or not we have saving faith, an enduring faith, a faith that works and that will not fizzle in the end. And that test is simply this, how we view money and how we view material possessions. Now, if you've been at Lindsay very long, you've probably never heard me preach on money. I've, it's, it's never been a big issue. It's just never been a big issue. Now, if I were preaching through the Bible and I get to a place where it talks about money, I'm not going to skip it. Are you okay with that? And that's why we're in James chapter 5 today. I could have skipped this passage. Um, wouldn't have been a big deal. But I believe it's a big deal to God that he gives us his word and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so, but I seldom talk about money. Some of you have been here 10 years and you've never heard me talk about money behind this pulpit. You might say, well, why? Because I've always believed that if a man's heart is right with God, his pocketbook will get right with God. Okay? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. While we should preach what the Bible says about money and about tithing and about offerings, we should never, never skip over those things. But I don't have to carry a 10-pound Bible around and beat people over the head and try to make them give. If you're going to give that away, just go ahead and keep it. Okay? Just go ahead and keep it. If your heart is right with God, no preacher is going to have to beg you to give. You will give from a grateful heart. You'll give from a heart that says, God, I have an abundance. You might say, but preacher, we don't have an abundance. Listen, if you're a child of God today and you live in America, you have an abundance. Amen. And just like the, the lady there in the Bible, when she came along, and, and I'll just use common numbers here. She only had three pennies, but she put all three pennies that she had uh, and gave it to God. And the rich guy comes by and drops a little, j just kind of just a little bit of his in and God blessed her and condemned him. So it's not, it's never the amount, it's the heart. Okay. Now, so God does not condemn riches. He does not, uh, it is not sin for a person to have wealth. It's a sin when wealth or material possessions have us, okay? Now, keep that in your mind. When they have us. I can relate to some of this in a lot of ways. And just to kind of get going, I'll mention, back years ago when Miss Deb and I first got, to, uh, before we got married, actually, <clears throat> we, I trained <clears throat> calf roping horses. And that was just part of my life. That's just what I did. And, and we would train horses and sell horses. That's one of the ways that, that we earned money. We earned a living doing that. But that completely dominated my life. And I was a Christian. Are y'all following me? How many of you know that even as a Christian, you could let something else dominate your life? I mean, the old devil is out there. He'll, he'll dangle. Listen, he don't dangle a carrot in front of you. He dangles a snicker. I mean, we can take or leave a carrot, but we're going to get that snicker. And so the old devil knows just what to dangle in front of us. Did you know there came a time when Miss Deb and I decided to be married that I knew in my heart that I could no longer, I could no longer have that because it had me. And we made a commitment, and from the time we married till this day, I've never competed again. Now, we play in the arena at home, but as far as, as, far as the competition of it, that thing that, that, ha, that, ha, that had me, and I, confession's good for the soul, okay? And I'm just saying that it had me, and we made a break from that. A number of years later, years later, from 77 to 94, in 94, I can't remember exactly what was going on, but it was like the Lord really spoke to my heart. Because the, grand, the kids were growing up, and I knew that one day we'd probably have grandkids, and I wanted them to enjoy some of the things that I did growing up. And it's like the Lord said, now you can have that, but don't ever let it have you. So we built an arena, and to this day, uh, it's part of our ministry, 
and we do it when it's handy. We don't do it. Uh, tomorrow it's supposed to be 105, and I'm going to break the bad news to you all right now. Pardon the English. We ain't doing it tomorrow. Okay, so I just made the announcement. Too hot. But did you know that when it had me, it didn't make any difference. Man, we would weather the storm. It didn't matter if it was 110 or 10 below because it had us or it had me. So I'm simply saying this, that whether it be a vice, whether it be a, a habit or whether it be material possessions, God doesn't mind if we have those things as long as those things do not have us. Okay? Now keep that in mind. So the people that he was writing to obviously were controlled by their wealth. I just read something this last week. At the University of California at Los Angeles, I believe in short that would be UCLA, they did a survey among the freshmen there just a couple of years ago. 75% of the freshmen that were in this, this poll, if you will, said that the most important thing was to be financially well off. Okay? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. To be financially well off. 75%, that was their goal. A little bit later, many of you have heard of the Pew Research Center. They do polls all over the world. At that same college, 80% of those attending between 18 and 25 years of age said that their main goal was to get rich. Okay? I want you to think about this. So is there anything wrong with getting rich? Is there anything wrong with having great possessions? And once again, the answer is no. But when that becomes the driving force of my life, it has gone from ambition to sin. Okay? Are y'all following me? When that becomes the, the primary goal of your life is to be financially well off or, as the, as the poll shows, to be rich, then that becomes sin. The primary goal of every child of God should be, and I heard this, it's not original, to make God look good. The goal of every child of God should be to exalt our Heavenly Father. Not to seek riches and wealth. But yet this world teaches us that that's the norm and that's the way to go. And our young people, by the time they get through high school, the, their goal is to get rich. Most of them can't read, but they do want to get rich. Did y'all, I threw that in there. I'm kind of scattered this morning. I heard on the news the other night that in a Tulsa public school system, uh, I think Jameson heard this too, maybe, or Justin, one of them, that there's a 5% reading proficiency in the school system at Tulsa. You know what that means? That means that only five out of every hundred can read. <laughs> but they're going to get rich because that's the goal. Now, y'all stay with me, and I'll try, to get, I'll try to stay on track here. So the Bible never condemns wealth. We know that many men in the Bible were possessors of great wealth, money, material possessions. The condemnation or the sin is not having. It's the manner in which we acquire that wealth and the manner in which we use that wealth. Now, that's going to bring us right to the text. So what was James rebuking? What was James condemning, if you will? He was condemning the manner in which they acquired their wealth and the manner in which they used or misused their wealth. Okay? Now, with that said, there's many other scriptures. Proverbs 15, 27, the Bible says... He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. If, if greed for gain is all that's on your mind, it will bring trouble 
to your house, to your home, to your family, to those around you. Proverbs 28, 22. The Bible says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. You see, money or wealth has always been a problem for believers and unbelievers alike. I began to look at Scripture over the week at how that money has affected so many people through life. And, and I'm talking about in, in the Word of God. And I'll just remind you of a story that some of you will be familiar with. Probably most of you will not be because it's seldom even looked at. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, and uh, I'm going to read something to you there. In 2 Chronicles 25, Judah's king Amaziah, uh, Amaziah was getting ready to go into a battle with Seir or the Edomites. And he, in his mind, he realized that his army was not great enough. So he hired 100,000 men of Israel. Now, he was the king of Judah. He hired 100,000 men and paid them 100 talents of silver, which, oh, I'd say today would be about three and a half tons of silver. He paid them to come and ally with him and fight against the Edomites. God sent a man to him, a man of God, and said, Amaziah, don't go into the battle with 100,000 men of Israel because I am not with them. They had been so disobedient to God. He says, I am not with those men. So if you go into the battle with those 100,000 men, you're going to fall in the battle. So you would think that the king would say, hey, guys, uh, y'all going home. Do you know what the king did? He looked at the man of God and he goes, well, what about the money I gave him? Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. God had sent the man of God to say to him, if you go into the battle with these men, you're going to fall in the battle. Send them away. King Amaziah was more worried about his money than he was the protection of God. Because God said, if you'll send them back, am I not able to take care of you? I'm going to take care of you. You're not to go into the battle with these people that I'm not blessing. But he was more worried about the money than he was the protection of God. And guys, I can, we can make that applicable. There are many people in our world today that they will totally ignore the word of God and totally ignore the will of God to protect their money. To protect that asset. Now you might say, what happened to King Amaziah? What happened? Well, you can read that in 2 Chronicles 25 in your quiet time. Okay? It's a great story. It's a great blessing. So you can read that in your quiet time. 2 Chronicles 25. Now, did you know or can I remind you that Judas sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver? Judas, listen, he valued silver more than he valued the Savior. He valued his silver more than the Savior. And for 30 pieces of silver sold out the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that in Matthew 28, those who guarded the tomb of Jesus Christ took money from the chief priest and the elders to tell a lie? Some of you have never read this, but I want, to, I want to encourage you to read it in Matthew 28. The Bible says that these men who guarded the tomb of Christ, they knew that Jesus rose from the dead that day. They knew it because the stone was rolled away and Jesus was gone and they were there and they knew what happened. And when they reported what happened to the elders and the chief priest, the elders and the chief priest said, we can't let that get out. So what we're going to do is we're going to make up a lie and we're going to give you money to tell the lie. And so they said, here's what you're going to tell. You're going to tell that in the middle of the night his disciples came and stole his body away. That way it'll take away from this resurrection stuff. It'll take away from the miracle of, of Jesus rising from the dead. And the Bible says that those, that those men that guarded the tomb took money 
and passed a lie. And the Bible says that to this very day, there are places where that lie is still believed and they did it for money. How many of y'all realize money has always been a problem? Money has always been a problem. As a matter of fact, Paul told Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. We'll get to that after a while. Did you know that in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, Jesus spoke to the church at Laodicea. And he said to them, you, and I'm going to paraphrase, they were rich and increased with goods. Rich and increased with goods, but they were blinded to their own spiritual condition. Because Jesus said, you're poor and wretched and naked and miserable and blind. Money blinded them. Did you know that having riches, and I've said this, I'm going to say it four or five times before I finish today. Having riches and possessions are not a sin. Deuteronomy 8.18, the Bible says, it is good. I'm, I'm sorry, it is God that giveth thee power to get wealth. It is God that giveth thee power to get wealth. Many other places in Scripture elude to that very fact. So now if you'll go all the way back to James 5 and look at there at the verses with me. I just gave you all about 35 minutes of introduction here. And now we're going to look at this, this passage. You know, it never bothers me not to get finished with a particular message because we can just place it. My messages are like baloney. You can just cut them off anywhere. <laughs> you remember when you used to get baloney in the big old sticks, rack the ridge, just cut it off where you wanted it. But he didn't learn much from me. Have y'all noticed how long he preaches? <laughs> he loves to preach Sunday nights because he, he can preach longer on Sunday nights. It doesn't bother him when y'all close your eyes to rest because it's nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Chapter 5, verse number 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep, and howl for your misery that shall come Upon you. Th that's, that does not need a whole lot of commentary, does it? He says to the wicked rich. He's not talking to wealthy people that love God and, and, and give and support those that are needy and literally, literally make part of their life Looking out and seeing who can I help? Who needs help? Where can I share the things that God has given to me? He's not talking about those people. He's talking to those people who have and who hoard and who keep and store and refuse to help somebody that they know is without basic needs. That's who he's talking to. And he says this. He says, you... Rich men, weep and howl for your misery that shall come upon you. Just, I can't do anything in one word, but just to touch this briefly. There is a great condemnation to those who possess wealth to hoard it for yourself and allow those around you to be hungry. And to not be clothed. And to have nothing. There is a great judgment coming for that. Now, he goes on in verse number 2. He says, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. As a matter of fact, I think we could lump verse 3 with that. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. You shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. You see, he condemned the hoarding of their riches. They hoarded their stuff until it became useless. Now, I'm not, I'm not up on all this, but um, when it says moth-eaten, I guess I could do it this way. How many of you ever, have ever gone to your closet 
And some of you men are smiling, nodding your head, and looking at your wife. But I know some men that have that have so much in their closet, and and so I'm a I'm gonna be a closet preacher right now. And you hadn't worn it in so long. You gave a lot of money for it. After after all, you you got it on the blue light special at Kmart. Chet came in with a green shirt on. Jerry came in with a green shirt on. Somebody, uh, James has got a green tie on. I looked around this morning. I thought, man, they must have had a green light special somewhere. <laughs> but you've got stuff stored up. And then one day, one day you wake up and you're ready to go to church and sit on the pew and say amen. And you go, you open your closet and it looks like, listen, your clothes are hanging in there. It looks like a used car dealership. And, I mean, you just look from end to end. Everywhere you look, there's stuff to wear. And you go, you know what? I remember, I remember I got a dress on sale or a pair of pants on sale. And I'm taking you men in on this. And, uh, let's see, that's been about three or four years ago. I've never worn that. And so you reach and get it and you bring it out. And right there where the, where the hanger was, uh, either a cricket or, or something is eat a hole in it. Now, has that ever happened to any of y'all? What were you saving it for? God will feed the crickets and the roaches without your help. So what were you saving it for? You know what? You were saving it so you could consume it for yourself. When maybe you had a neighbor down the road that could have used that when it was still usable, you could have, there could have something good come from that while it was still in the kind of shape that it could be used, but no. No, we hoard it. We pack it. We put it back. You know, a guy the other day told me that he was needing a storage bin, a storage facility. And I said, well, they're all up and down the road. Here's what he told me. He said, I've called everyone. He gave me the names of the ones he's called. And he said, I can't find a vacant storage. I'm on the waiting list, but I cannot find a vacant storage. Now, what does that tell you? Man, we are a storing, hoarding bunch of folks. Oh, well, I'm going to use it. Listen, when you go get it, you'll probably find that it's all molded and not even fit to be used anymore. So what good did it do you? Now, you're, you're saying, preacher, are you advocating that we go home and have a closet cleaning? Now, I'm just picking on your closet right now, okay? I would say this. We have missions in Shakota and Eufaula. Every town has missions where you can take things and they will even go through them and, and what things are proper and what things are good. Do you know that you might be able to help somebody with what you've been hoarding? You might be able to. You might be able to clothe somebody with what you will never use. The moth will eat it. It will be rusted and cankered. And one day you'll pull it out and you'll, man, if I should have used that, it's all rusted up now. I'm just, he said, your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you. So with that said, I'd like to preach one of these, these verses in depth, but just, let's just go on to verse number four. And I want to tie together, if I may, verse number four and verse number six. The Bible says, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is if you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the crieth of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Look at verse 6. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. James condemned the wealthy because of how they acquired their wealth. They acquired it unjustly, unethically, and illegally. 
Okay? Now, you might say, where did you get all that? Leviticus 19.13, once again, you don't have to turn to these places. You can make note of them. The Bible says, the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee, talking about the employer, all night until morning. Deuteronomy 24 says the same thing in principle. In that day, day labor was a very common thing. And the day laborers were generally those that would be considered poor. Many of them would come to a particular place in the city, the town, uh, every morning. And the farmers or the merchant men or whoever needed help would come to those places. And there might be 30 or 40 men lined up there and all of them needing work. And if you needed five, you took your five and went to the field. And there was a set price that you were going to pay them for the day, their wages. But James said that there were those, those who were doing the hiring, the employer, most of them were wealthy, they would take advantage of their workers. And they would take them into the field and work them all day long. And they were expecting a dollar for that day's work or whatever you will. They were expecting a dollar for that day's work. And they were having to take that dollar and immediately go to the marketplace and buy some food for their wife and their children. And, and, and the employer wouldn't pay them. He would say, well, I'll, I'll pay you tomorrow. Or come back tomorrow, I'll work you another day, and then I'll pay you the next day. When the, the poor person was depending upon, because the law said to the employer, if you work a man today, and the agreement is you pay him today, then you pay him today. Otherwise, you are robbing him. And then the implication here is that many of the employers would work these men and they wouldn't pay them and they would have an attitude, what are you going to do about it? Well, let me tell you what they could do about it. Nothing. Because they didn't have the resources to challenge them legally and so they were literally stealing from those that were working and so they acquired their wealth by illegal, unjust means. And James, in the Word of God, James condemns such action. Are we okay? Say amen. amen. Hey, listen, we're at, we're at James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. So we're, we're going we're gonna to go ahead with it here. It was a sin. It was violating the rule of law. But the poor person had no way to defend themselves. And so they would go home after a day or two of hard work with nothing to feed their family, nothing to, to sustain them. And the rich got richer, and the poor got poorer. And you might say, well, that would never happen in our day. I mean, we've got the Department of Labor, you know. That'd be like telling on the fox for stealing the chicken. <laughs> the thought just came to my mind. Pastor Clay's probably already thought about this. In 2000, we had the bad ice storm here. Some of y can y'all remember the bad ice storm in 2000 where we didn't have electricity for 13 days on Texada Road? Guess what? If you got electricity, you rich. <laughs> I mean, to tell you, you know what I remember about that more than anything else? Is we have wood heat and we had propane heat and we have uh, electric and so we had heat in our house, and we had this little deal on the back porch where we would cook. And what I remember about those almost two weeks is so many people came to see us. <laughs> and they wouldn't go home. I mean, they literally wouldn't go home. I finally told my step one day, I said, Dem, quit cooking for them. <laughs> and they'll go on home. I mean, they'll go somewhere. She goes, but they don't have any place to go. And I said, well, they're not getting my bedroom. But what I really remember is that during that time, wealthy, wealthy companies came into our five or six counties here, wealthy companies, got major multi-million dollar contracts to clean up the mess up and down the roads and such as that. They were multi-million dollar contracts. Pastor Clay, because he was fluent in Spanish, made friends with a bunch of the Hispanic workers that worked in Muskogee County and here and other counties. And, and Clay began to communicate with them, make friends with them. 
As a matter of fact, we would send the church bands on Sunday evening to, to Shakota and pick those, those men up, bring them here. Pastor Clay would preach to them, and we would feed them and just try to befriend them, maybe share Christ. Some of them might get saved. And they told us after a month or so of being in the area, they told Pastor Clay, said, we're, we're going to be leaving. The job is over, and we're heading to another state, and so we're leaving. So we had a little goodbye for him here. Some of y'all kind of remember during that, during that uh, time, we, we just got so acquainted with those guys. They were such wonderful guys. About three or four days after they were supposed to be gone, Pastor Clay told me, he said, Dad, those, those Hispanic, those Mexican men are just wandering the streets of Shakota. And so he asked them, what's going on? And they said, well, the man that hired us, he, he would... We would work for a week, and then he would only give us half of our wages and tell us that he would pay us the rest the next week. And then the next week, he would only pay us half. And, and he got us all going here, and he said, then the job is over, and we get up this morning, and the boss is gone, and everybody's gone, and we're just left here. We don't have any money. We don't have anywhere to go. Now, some of you might say, well, were they illegal? Let me just say this. I believe in the rule of law, okay? I believe in the rule of law. So with that said, I don't care if they were legal, illegal, or a Japanese monkey. If the boss agreed to work them and pay them, he owed them. Do you understand that? James is saying to the people in chapter 5, he's saying... You made a deal, and you are stealing from poor people that cannot have any recourse against you because they're too poor. You might say, well, what would you all do? I praise God Clay could talk Spanish. So we found out what their deal was. We found out how much was owed to them, to the whole group. It turned out that I happened to know a fella that was in charge of them getting their money. I'm talking about the company. I love this. I love to tell this story. So I called this fellow and I said, hey, that contractor has refused to pay the laborers that worked in Muskogee County. He goes, oh, really? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm glad you called me because we're having a meeting Monday morning and we're ready to pay them their last payment on this contract. And it was a million dollars. A million dollars. He said, can you be at the meeting? I said, yeah. Praise God. So I sat in the meeting. It was the neatest thing. Did you know that even corrupt people can do math? I mean, the corruptest of folk can do math. And so they had the agenda. I wasn't on the agenda, but I was there. And so they, they, these lawyers they, with the company, they pulled out all their stuff. They were showing all that they had done, and they were there to get their final draw. And the man that was in charge said, we got a problem here. He said, Pastor Turner, do you want to explain what the problem is? And I said, yeah, these guys are, have stolen from their employees. They refuse to pay their employees. Woo! One guy said, you're talking way out of your league, preacher. Can I tell you something? I found this out. If I'm on God's side, not, not whether he's on my side, if I'm on God's side, we got the advantage. And the man said, this meeting is over. He said, you guys need to get with the pastor. He'll tell you how much money you owe the laborers. And you pay the laborers or you get nothing else. This meeting's over. So guess what? The guy goes, how much do we owe him? <laughs> now, I, I just say that to say this. Pastor Clay and I had an opportunity that day to stand up for somebody that didn't have a way to stand. Man, I tell you what, I know Clay remembers this. They said, uh, I mean, they were almost like begging because they did the math. They go, we only owe these guys about six or $8,000. And there's a lot of difference in six and 8,000 versus a million. And then they said, we have an office set up in a motel, and if you'll come to that motel, we'll give you the cash. 
Cash. You know why? Because they, listen, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so that day, Clay and I, we had two church bands loaded with Mexicans. Man, it was great. And we drive up to the motel. I get out, and I start in. Just before I knock on the door, we had two, uh, we had two law officers in our church at that time. And I was getting ready to knock on the door, and my phone rang. And one of them said, uh, Preacher, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm getting ready to. I said, where are you? He said, we're right across the street watching to make sure everything's all right. <laughs> Listen, I give that illustration to say this. James condemned that in Scripture. And it's going on today, even in our civilized world. So what James is saying to those in that day that wouldn't even help those of their brethren many times that were scattered because of religious persecution, they wouldn't even help them. And the same kind of ill, unjust activity goes on today. And the same word of God that condemned it then condemns it now. Now, I'm going to get to the end of this. He goes on in verse number 5. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. That's going to take a little bit of time. I'll just paraphrase very quickly. What he was saying is, you have used your riches all for yourself for lavish living, arrogantly displayed, and refused to help somebody that needs a hand up. I'm grateful to this church. I'm grateful to every one of you. Because by the grace of God, and I'm commending you, by the grace of God, our church, even this very day, we, were in, we are involved in the exact same thing that James was talking about. Did you know that there are believers all over this world, even in countries where you cannot have a Bible, you cannot openly pray, you'll be arrested for that, but we have missionaries in those countries today that our church supports every month. And they are literally reaching out to the scattered. I'm not going to call any names because in some of those countries, even what they're doing cannot be made public. Even out here, especially with, with the communications that we have today, it would be wrong for me to call their names. But some of our missionaries today, this very day, are literally helping religious uh, Christian people that are being persecuted because you are willing to take what God has given to you and send it all across the world to help the scattered, to help those that need not only to hear the gospel, but they need a hot meal, they need clothes, they need the very basics of life. And when we have the ability to do that, but we hear the preaching and we sing the songs and we walk out of a sanctuary that's so comfortable and we get into a car that is so comfortable and go to a home that we can adjust the temperature any time of year. And we turn and look the other way when brothers and sisters in Christ that are scattered because of religious persecution and they're crying out for help. But let me tell you the glory of that. James said, but their cries came to the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, and he will answer. Is there anything wrong with having wealth and possessions? No. He never, God never condemns that. But he does condemn the manner in which it is acquired and the way in which it is used. So with that said, the Bible says this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What does it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his soul. I've buried a lot of really, really rich people. People that could buy anything they wanted to buy, like Solomon. Whatever, I, whatever my eyes looked at, if I wanted it, I got it. 
And I've buried a lot of people like that. And all they had, they left behind. And they had no, nothing stored up in heaven. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his soul? What has this morning profited us if someone walks out of this building lost and you die before you ever have another opportunity to give your life to Christ, what has all this profited you? Nothing. I know in a congregation this size, there's people that are not saved. There'll never be a better time than now for you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's all stand together. Miss Kristen, if you'll make your way to the piano, please. And once again, I rejoice, I rejoice in the fact that God has so, so blessed our church. He has blessed many of us individually, and He continues to do so. And while Miss Kristen is coming, I want you to bow your head with me and close your eyes. And I want to read three verses in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The Bible says in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to give, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Miss Christian, if you'll play, if you're not saved today, there'll never be a better time for you to give to give your life to Jesus. Today's the day of salvation. Would you come? We have people that are trained to pray with you and share with you how you can know Christ. Listen, if you're not certain of your salvation, why not come down here? We'll, we'll have somebody to pray with you and you can make certain your salvation. Would you come? Whatever God deals with your heart about, you come. If you just need to kneel at these altars and pray, you do that. Listen, God is trying to do something in our lives. He's drawing us to Himself, especially in these last days. You may say, Preacher, as I've sat here and listened to this message, I realize that I, I have so much and I've not been willing to share. I've not been willing to help others that are in need right where you stand you can say God forgive me of that and help me Lord to help me Lord to be as gracious in giving with what you've given to me whatever God has dealt with your heart about God can take care of that today if you need to come would you come now once again if you're not saved no one's looking around right now heads are bowed and eyes are closed if you'd say, Preacher, I know I need to give my life to Jesus today. I've played around with this. I've waited. But I know I need to give my life to Jesus. Would you just step right here? Just step right here where I am and I'll have somebody to pray with you. Would you do that? Some are at these altars praying. Don't, don't leave the way you came. If you need to get saved, today's the day. She's going to play one more verse. If you don't come, you'll close the service. Jesus, Jesus, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't want to interrupt anybody. Okay. That's all right. Y'all can look up here. Tell me what's going on. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> about time, huh? <laughs> Jimmy comes to give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we love you. And um, right now, Darlene and Shed are the happiest two people in the world. Except for Jimmy. Okay, we love you. God bless you. Okay, amen. We look forward to seeing you tonight, 6 o'clock. Pastor Clay is going to be preaching and uh, on his loosely constructed series in the Old Testament. And uh, we're looking really forward uh, to that. And so I hope you'll come and be a part of it. It'll be a great, great blessing to you. Uh, if I could, where's Justin Knight? Justin, would you make your way up here, please? And we'll have Justin to dismiss us. And uh, once again, I wanted to mention uh, Justin preaches down at the lake every Sunday morning at 8.30. And uh, been having good crowds this summer. Sometimes there's a whole bunch of people. Sometimes there's just a few. But uh, he, he delivers the whole load, no matter how many is there. And so, Jesse, we appreciate your faithfulness. Dismiss us, would you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for salvation this morning, Lord. We thank you for Jimmy and him coming to know you today, Lord. I thank you for Pastor being able to just come up here and just to preach your word, Lord. He doesn't hold anything back. He just shares what you put on his heart, Lord. And I know that you're speaking to us this morning, Lord. I pray you continue to speak to us this week. Help us to go out and tell someone else about you, Lord. We don't need to keep that to ourselves. Lord, we need to give to you in every way that we can out of our time, treasure, and talent. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us. Just help us to do your will today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.